Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Geezerology's Wednesday Spotlight. Today, we are going to talk about uh, this kind of, it's an, it's an obscure, I guess you could call it an obscurity from 1974. It's an album called Phantom's Divine Comedy, Part One. That's the official title of the album. This is an album that came out in 1974, in the spring of 1974. Uh, it was released by Capitol Records. It wasn't a uh, you know a little fly by night deal. It, you know, Capitol Records released it, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to re-roll the tape and go back in time and talk about what was going on when this album was released. Um, I don't remember the exact month, and there's not a whole lot of information online about this album. So I couldn't find the exact release date of this, but I'm pretty sure it was sometime in the spring of 1974. We do know it was 1974. We're, we just don't know exactly what date in 1974. This was an album that was released among a little bit of fanfare. Uh, I remember reading about it when it was, uh, when it was released. This guy, uh, I want to show you the cover of the album here. Uh, that's my original copy that I bought in the spring of 1974. This ostensibly was Jim Morrison. Now, this is two years af after Morrison died, three years, actually three years after Morrison died. And this thing appeared, and the whole thing was there were, there were rumors going around that this was uh, Jim Morrison come back from the grave. You know, there were all these rumors that uh, Morrison didn't really die, that you know, that he went, uh, he went that he actually disappeared to Africa and started running guns or, <laughs> or something like that. But anyway, this thing, this thing just came out of nowhere, Phantom's Divine Comedy and by Capitol Records. And, and, and it was, and it was supposedly Jim, Jim Morrison returning to, uh, to recording. Uh, there were those rumors for a while, but, uh, uh, and when it came out, there's, there's, there are no credits on this record. Uh, vocals, guitars, and piano were done by Phantom. Drums and percussion were played by X. Bass was played by Y. Piano and organ was played by Z. And Phantom also played uh, background guitar and piano. It was produced by somebody named Erg Troited. Some some sort of some sort of made up name. There is one name. There is one real name that gets credit on this album, and it's uh, mastered by Bob Dennis right there. I, I, that's probably too small to see. I'll get a photo on the uh, post production so you can get a closer look at that. Uh, but yeah, it was it was uh, made by Capitol Right. Anyway, so there were these rumors that this was Jim Morrison. Uh, just coming back, he wanted to record, but he didn't want everybody to know that it was really him. So he made up all these names and everything like that. Uh, some people said that it was a, there was one rumor that, that this was actually a solo album that he recorded while he was in Paris before he died. And then uh, Capitol Records got a hold of the tapes and released it. But anyway, so this thing came out. I ran out and bought it. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I was skeptical of all this stuff, but it's like, with, but with all this buzz that was going on around it at the time, and the uh, I, I was I was reading Cream Magazine at the time, I was reading Rolling Stone at the time, so so somewhere in there, I, I was read about this album. I went out and bought it. I didn't I didn't buy the hoax, but I, of course I wanted to, I wanted to hear this album anyway. Bought it, brought it home, uh, and the singer, whoever he was. There are a few spots in this record where he does a pretty good Jim Morrison imitation. You know, it's, it's obviously not the doors. This is more, this, this is a little more hard rock. Uh, these are in the days before, before heavy metal was a thing when it was just, it, it, this is during the days when we were kind of transitioning from, from what we called hard rock into heavy metal. This is sort of in that transition period after Black Sabbath had been around for a while now. Uh, but anyway, uh, it obviously wasn't Jim Morrison, obviously wasn't door, wasn't the doors because it's only, there are only just a few spots in this album where he does pull off a pretty good Jim Morrison impression. Uh, 
the rest of the time. But anyway, but but it, it's a pretty good album. It's a pretty good album in the hard rock genre. It's just it's just not a Doors album. It's not a Jim Morrison album, right? But we'll we'll talk specifically about the music in this album after after I get through the story. So uh, recently, so anyway, this album disappeared. It went out of print, and Bob and I were talking about. Uh, three or four months ago, we were talking about uh, maybe doing a, a piece on this album, but then I got to looking around. It wasn't available anywhere. It wasn't on any streaming services. I couldn't find it on YouTube or anything like that. I'm going, well, you know, let's, let's not do it because it's like the, the people can't go out and, and listen to it. And then about eight weeks ago, we started talking about it again. And I said, no, it's not available anywhere. And Bob looked on Apple music and saw that it was released on it's on apple music and i went and checked this on youtube well it turned out this thing's been re-released -re within the last seven or eight weeks just out of nowhere i mean there's been no announcement of it it just appeared in a remastered version it's labeled as a remastered version and uh uh and now it's out there so we said okay let's talk about it so uh so I went in and started looking for some information on this record. And maybe if we found out who this guy was or anything like that, there is no, uh, there is no source material on who this guy was or what he was. All that there is really out there are a few blog posts from back in the mid two thousands of, of a blogger or somebody who, uh, who saw an interview somewhere with the guy who actually uh, who actually produced this album or saw a couple of uh, saw an interview somewhere with a guy who goes by X who was the drummer or something like that. So there's no source material. There's just rumors out there. But the story as best as I can pull it together from from what little information is there is that this is a guy who, use the stage name Arthur Pendragon if and, and those of you who, uh, who who know classic literature Arthur Pendragon is the name of, of King Arthur from King Arthur and round tables but but anyway this guy he, he was he was uh, he was somebody out of Detroit he came he was he was he was part of that whole Detroit music scene that included Iggy pop uh, you know, uh, Ted Nugent was around then. Bob Seger was around there. That whole late '60s, early '70s, uh, uh, when when uh, when rock uh, when hard rock bands were really flourishing in Detroit and, and emerging out of Detroit, this guy was part of that scene. And and uh, uh, I've I've found a source that says his real name was Ted Pearson. Who was and he was and he was a fairly well known guy around Detroit at the time. Uh, another source I found said that his name was Tom Carson, but that was only one source. I found I found three or four different places where his name was Ted Pearson. Uh, again, went by the stage name of Arthur Pendragon. After this happened, he started going by this. He he, he adopted the name Phantom as his name. Uh, he was a real guy. He was around, and I did find there were used to. John Densmore has a website. John Densmore used to have a, uh, you know, a fan forum, you know, for, like a bulletin board. The old, not, you know, the old, before social media, we had bulletin boards, right? And on John Densmore's website, there was a bulletin board. Densmore did it, uh, and, and, and it's no longer there, but I did go back to the uh, Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive, and I found this, I found this uh, page. And there's somebody on there who posted in this fan forum. He gave a little. He, he gave a little deeper story about what this was, but he just got it from rumors and other inter and, and interviews that he read in this magazine or that magazine or whatever. Uh, he said that uh, this band, the name of Arthur Pendragon, the name of his band was Walpurgis. Uh, which, uh, which Wal Walpurgis has something to do with, uh, I, I think it's, it's a Europe, it's a European version of Halloween, basically, is what Walpurgis is. Uh, but anyway, uh, Walpurgis actually recorded an album, supposedly, uh, in 1973, the year before this came out, and it never got any release. It didn't sold, nobody picked it up. 
and an album appeared by some small label just out of nowhere in 1990 called Phantom, the Lost Album, which was supposedly this band Walpurgis 1973 album that somebody got a hold of and released. There's some dispute over that. Uh, a couple years later, after Phantom's Divine Comedy came out, uh, Walpurgis apparently recorded another album, couldn't get it sold because this Phantom Divine kind of didn't sell very much. And, you know, it was like it was, people thought it was a gimmick, so nobody would, would release it. But, maybe, but, but this, this album that appeared in 1990, they say it could have been some tracks from the, from the previous album, some tracks from that late album. Nobody really knows. It's, but it's, it's out there. That album is actually on YouTube if you want to go find it. It's called Phantom, The Lost Album. In 1974, in the summer of 1974, Ray Manzarek uh, got together with Robbie Krieger and they put together a two-night show at the Whiskey A Go-Go that was a tribute to the Doors and a tribute to Jim Morrison. Iggy Pop showed up there. Uh, Alice Cooper showed up there. And also a guy who Ray Manzarek identified as Ted something or other was there. Ted something or other was uh, Arthur Pendragon. And there are photos. <clears throat> okay. Uh, right there. I don't know if he's, but, but right there on the left is, is uh, actually a, a thing I found. This is a reverse image of the Phantoms Divide comedy album cover. Uh, that shows uh, Arthur Pendragon dragging a little clearer. You can you can you, you get a be little better look at him. But anyway, these other these black and white photos are pictures of Arthur Pendragon with some people at this uh, Whiskey a Go Go show. And there are two photos that Manzarek is in there with him. Uh, Iggy's in a couple of the photos, and uh, there's Alice Cooper in one of the photos. There's Krieger in one of the photos. The other guy in that photo with Krieger is uh, Danny Sugarman, the Doors manager at the time. These were shot over the in the at the two nights at the uh, Whiskey a Go Go. Supposedly, the 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 where, when I found these photos, uh, somebody said that these photos appeared in uh, Cream magazine at the time, but there's no documentation. We don't we we don't know for sure. That's just. Uh, you know, that's, that's just rumor upon rumor upon rumor. Anyway, uh, yeah, so there's all these rumors. There was even a rumor that that was actually Iggy Pop was the Phantom, uh, but that was pretty much shot down. Ig Iggy tried to claim at one point that he was the Phantom, but but everybody, no, 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 it wasn't Iggy Pop. Uh, Anyway, but that's where we were. That's the story of this album. And then it disappeared for a long time. And then, like I say, about, about eight, seven or eight weeks ago, this thing reappeared on, uh, this thing reappeared in, in, uh, in circulation. And now it's on all the streaming services and things like that. So maybe at some point soon, somebody will, will, will show up and tell us a real story of this. But that's the story of this album as I know it. Uh, I know that Bob, at some point a few years later, I, I met Bob a few years later, and I showed him this uh, this album, and he said, oh, and he got interested in it. So he went out and bought it, you know, back in 75 or 76. And and I know, I know for fact, I, D probably doesn't own it, but I know that D heard it once or twice back in the day when we were kids, because I'm sure I would have played it for him. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's the story of the album. Uh, I just want to say before I turn it over, I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to you two guys to talk about what you actually hear in this album in 2021. But I just I just want to say first that uh, that this this you know it was a gimmick album, obviously, uh, and and it was uh, just a one shot deal, you know, and it, it like it disappeared for a long time. But listening to this album now, it's it's not a bad record. 
<laughs> it's a pretty good record. It's it's more along the lines of a Blood Rock album or a Black Sabbath album or or maybe like a Bob Seger album. Something like that. Yeah, it's more. It sounds more like that than the Doors. It just sounds like it just sounds like somebody who who is who is a pretty competent uh, a band who's a pretty competent uh, hard rocker at the time. Uh, just going into a, a little bit of a Jim Morrison impression every now and then. Um, Anyway, uh, uh, Bob, take it over. I'm tired of talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scotty. Thank you. Yeah, I remember I got introduced to, to this album by you when, um, you know, we were in college and roommates and all that. And um, I didn't buy into the myth that it was Morrison, but I thought it was still a cool, you know, thing to have just as part of the whole Doors um, thing. And um, I haven't listened to it in a long, long time. And then, you know, we started talking about it and stuff. So, yeah, it, you know, and it, so like I say, I listen to it. You know, I've been on a road trip, so I listen to it in the car and stuff. And you're right. It's not a bad album. You know, it, it definitely is a product of its time. And from what I understand, um, Ted Pearson, alias Arthur Pendragon, wrote this as a rock opera and based it on uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. And um, there is a guy who's got a, who's a blogger and he, and he writes a lot about the Detroit music scene. And he's actually got some books that he's written about it that are available on Amazon. I think they're kind of a self-published thing. And I read his stuff and, and he, you know, he digs into this guy's history and it's really kind of a sad story. You know, if his, if what this blogger writes is accurate yeah. and this Ted Pearson wound up committing suicide uh, in 1999, I believe it was, in, yeah. let, me, let me interject. He was, it was in a, they found him in an apartment, Carl Springs, Florida, which is yes. just about, you know, about, about three miles North of, of me. But I, yeah, I, I read that this week and I, I had no idea that you know, it was in Coral Springs. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, yeah. And so anyway, I, you know, this, this guy is, is part of the Detroit music scene. Uh, his first band was called Madrigal. And then he switched it to the name Wild Purgis, which is a term reference to a gathering of witches. And interestingly, I think Wild Purgis was one of the first names picked by Black Sabbath. So, you know, they got, you know, so there's some ties in here. Um, not ties, but interesting little, you know, tidbits. Right. Um, and I guess this guy was, um, Wild Purgis was, given the opportunity to record this album uh, at, a dis at a recording studio there in the Detroit area. And I guess they were like, yeah, you can come in when nobody else is doing this. And according to this blogger, the, um, the guy who owned that studio took the music to Capitol and Capitol got it. And then I don't know whether Capitol intentionally said, hey, we're going to try to milk the Morrison thing or not. But um, you know, they, they capital put it out as the Phantom, whereas originally it was supposed to have been under the Wall Purgis name as, you know, Divine Comedy. So um, what I would, I would love to know more about this because it's like, I would love to know how that happened without the guy who wrote the music okaying it. Right, and, right. You know, so so there's, a, there's a lot of holes in this story that I'd love to know. Yeah, there's, and, right. You found, you found some, details that I, I that I didn't stumble across what I yeah. I did see something I did see a reference at Electra Records when Electra Records heard about this and they actually heard an advanced copy of this Electra Records actually uh sued Capitol Records trying to uh trying to trying to block it and uh because they thought that they were you know because they saw what how they were marketing it and everything and and, and the door's name and they, and they were trying to block that and they came and they came some came to some sort of agreement and part of the agreement was that 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 they were they were not going to uh tell the world who this really was and who the songwriters were and they were going to market it as a goof and that, so that so that was part of the settlement. The Capitol Records was just going to market it as a as as a goofy little thing and not a real and not a real thing. Yeah, and and this this blogger also contends that Danny Sugarman, you know, who was part of that whole Doors organization, actually reached out to Ted Pearson slash Arthur Pendragon because he was thinking, hey, this guy could be the new vocalist for the Doors. 
And supposedly that's why Pearson wound up there at the Whiskey A Go Go, because it was kind of supposed to be kind of an audition for him to be the new Doors front man. And I guess that didn't work out. But this blogger also has on his page has a reproduction of pages from Cream Magazine where you've got some of those photos. And there's a story in there where there's a shorter article where it's an interview with Ray Manzarek. And Manzarek talks about that night at the whiskey. And it was called Jim Morrison's, a Jim Morrison Memorial Disappearance Party. And uh, Manzarek claimed that this Pearson guy did a version of um, Riders on the Storm. And then Iggy Pop came on and did um, Maggie McGill and Backdoor Man. And Pop, Iggy Pop was in leather pants and I supposedly really channeled Morrison. So, um, but I remember the rumors at the time that, you know, uh, that, you know, obviously was Morrison and all that stuff. Then it segued into, I know this is Iggy Pop and lots of different rumors floating around. And this was the same era, you know, we had Paul McCartney is not dead and, and all of those kind of rumors going on. So, um, you know, you mentioned this earlier. It's, it's pretty obvious if you really listen to it, it's not Morrison. You know, I think like the first song, um, it starts out, you go, wow, man, that could be Jim, you know, but it doesn't last long. And then, right. you know, it, the vocals change and there's one or two songs on the album where it's pretty consistent. You know, he's, the, he does sound like Morrison, but you know, the, the, the music is, and the subject matter, you know, this guy obviously was really into his um, Elizabethan mythology and the, and the Merlin and King Arthur and all of those things. And, you know, that was never something that Morrison was into. So I, like I say, I never bought into it, but it is a fun thing to listen to, you know, and I've turned some people onto it over the years. It's like, hey, you know, if you really like the Doors Man, you got to check this out. It's just kind of an interesting thing. So um, I wish I could knew, I wish I knew more about the real story of how this all happened and what, what this did to the guy. I know that the blogger talks about all the things that happened to him later in life, you know, that led to his unfortunate suicide. So it's kind of a sad story that, you know, then the guy could never get any traction, you know, as, as a real rock star, but it's, it's an interesting piece of uh, rock and roll history. And um, I also want to mention, um, the whole Morrison is not dead thing, I think led to the movie Eddie and the Cruisers, you know? Oh, right. Where, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, because, and I, and I think that had to have been modeled on the, on the mythology of Jim Morrison faking yeah. his death and right, disappearing, yeah. Yeah. you know? So, but uh, you know, I, I would urge, I would, I would really encourage people to go to Apple music or whatever streaming service has and listen to it. It's, it's an interesting album. It's not terrible. It's not something that I would have on regular rotation, but it's not horrible. You know, it, it's definitely a, a product of the 70s, um, but it's not horrible. It, it's a fun listen, you know, and and what I would love to know and I'm, you know, and I've tried to find this out and I haven't found any source material is whether the times that he sounds like Morrison I wonder what, was it intentional? I mean, did he really do it on purpose or was it just, an accident because he's got a couple different vocal styles on here. So yeah, I've got, I, that's I've my got, big question. I've got a theory on it, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my theory on that. Uh, let's, let's give D the floor and, and hear what D has to say about this thing. Before. <clears throat> well, there's not much to put in since Bob went through that comprehensive uh, <laughs> of, of uh, litany of footnotes there. Sorry, so, Dan, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. <laughs> no, no, that's okay, because obviously we're reading the same sources. Uh, <laughs> I was going to bring up about that one blogger who mentioned, uh, you know, through this whole thing, yes, uh, you know, as a, as a musical thing, it's a product of its times. It, it had, there's, you know, I, I would say the musicianship is pretty competent. And yes, this guy, Ted Pearson, a.k.a. Arthur Pendragon, does conjure up some some of Morrison's vocal qualities. Yeah, there's a, a, a little uh, sort of a mysterious quality to it, but anybody that's listened to the Doors for any length of time knows even by the end of the first song, that's not Jim Morrison. And then as you go into it farther, the writing, the, the topics, you know, Morrison never wrote about wizards and Merlins and things like that. 
he was a lot more earthy when he felt like, and he, and he could be, you know, poetically mis, uh, obscure at the same time. But yeah, it, it's kind of a fun album. I mean, the guitar work reminded me of a cross between Black Sabbath and Iron Butterfly uh, with that controlled, distorted fuzz tone and, and all that. Um, I think they must have... I don't know what they paid these musicians. I'm sure it was barely human uh, union scale, but uh, I, I think <clears throat> the whole thing for our probably came, my theory is from Capitol Records. They thought, well, maybe we can capitalize on this stuff flying around. And as Bob mentioned, it was the, it was a few years after the Paul, the Paul is dead type thing. And uh, there was a lot of conspiracies of different things and, entertainment world and politics in the 70s. So I think that fed into it. But ultimately, if this blogger is correct, it's it has a sad ending with uh, Pearson ending up, you know, committing suicide in a motel or hotel room in, you know, South Florida there. Uh, that's the sad part of it all. Uh, one thing I did, you already mentioned it, but the source was I, I came across a, an old interview that Manzarek did with Allison Steele who in her day was a, a big rock journal. She did a lot of radio interviews. And he said, yeah, he says they were having like the fourth uh, anniversary of Jim Morrison's disappearance. That's how they build it at <clears throat> the whiskey at that time. And, and as uh, I think you and Scott mentioned, Alice Cooper was there and, and Iggy Pop. And they said, well, what about the guy that did the Phantom? And, and Manzarek says, ah, yes. He goes, uh, he goes, Ted Pearson or whatever. No, Manzarek Man Man called him Ted something or other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he probably couldn't remember his last name. Right, 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 right. right. And uh, he said he came on, he did Riders on the Storm, and he said he was he was okay. And then Iggy did, did it. But he didn't say too much more about that. He just said, yeah. And he was pretty matter of fact about it. And uh, I guess that was the end of the uh relationship between Ted Pierce and Manzarek and the rest of the doors at that point. But uh, I mean, all in all, uh, I, I think uh, with his, uh, with this, with the song credits and in, in the material, I think it was closer to sort of Black Sabbath with their, at least initially their uh, topics of astrology and uh, satanic type themes like that. So um, I, I think he was more interested in, in that, but I thought the guy had a, a good baritone voice. Um, he sound, I, he's, he, sound, he sounds to me, like he, he, he has a much more controlled voice than Morrison. You know, it, it's sort of that same timbre, but his control, I mean, you know, I mean, Morrison, Morrison would, you know, I mean, his, his, his voice would, uh, you know, Morrison, he'd do his little screams and his grunts and things like that. You don't get any of that here. This, to me, this, I kind of get the, I was, I was trying to figure out a way to describe it. His, he, he sounds like every once in a while, he sounds like crooner Jim Morrison. Yeah. Closer yeah, to you know, you know yeah. because it's just that controlled, uh, you know, pleasantly tenor voice that, that, that he, it does, it, he, he does sound like Jim Morrison here and there, but that he sounds like that Jim Morrison, the, the crooner Jim Morrison, not yeah. the, uh, you know, not the screamer and not the, uh, and not the emotive Jim Morrison. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I really, I don't have much else to add as, as far as that. And, uh, yeah, yeah it, was, it was an interesting listen. Uh, I mean, if it was released today, I don't think it would go anywhere, of course. But uh, um, it, it's, uh, I think <clears throat> it was probably a craven attempt by Capitol Records just to capitalize on a lot of, a lot yeah, of, I, I, yeah, I was, a, a, a rumor, a rumor mill. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know about craven attempt, but yeah, you know, they were, obviously, well, no. they, were, they were, they were, they were obviously. I, I, I think I would. They, go they were crazy. obviously trying to, uh, uh, you know, yeah, you know, trying to trying to make a few bucks on, on this rumor. But I'm just looking at the uh, the back album here, uh, reading some of the credits. Actually, all all songs are written by Phantom, so, so. 
apparently, I, apparently uh, uh, Arthur Arthur Pendragon wrote all these songs. Well, um, you know, Arthur Pendragon or Ted Pearson, I guess Capital felt like they couldn't sell any records using his name or any of the musicians' names. That the only way they were going to sell any copies was to kind of put it under this guise of maybe it's Jim Morrison, maybe it isn't. What what the, the... Oh, oh absolutely absolutely absolutely. I don't think and I don't think, I don't think Capital Records had any intention of 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 making a uh, of 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 trying to make a star sell any records by the band Wall Purges. <laughs> you know, you know, they, they, they were they were they were strictly capitalizing on the uh, on the Jim Morrison fever when they got yeah. this. You know, well, you know what the the thing I still really want to know is whether Pearson slash Pendragon went along with this. You know, I mean, did he? Oh, I'm he, sure he. Did. I'm sure he did. I mean, he got. Or you know, contract. if he didn't go along with it, you know, how could they have taken his music and put it out this way? you know, without his approval. So that, that's, that's a burning question I've got. And if he, if he agreed to it, why would he have agreed to it? Because it's like, you know, he's not going to get any credit. He can't tour with it or anything. I mean, you know, so it, it's, 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 a, it's, um, a foot, it's, it's a foot in the door. I don't, I, you know, I mean, I don't know. We, we know, don't, we don't, we don't know. We don't know. My, my I know theory, we don't know, but it's like, well, I might, if I was, and I don't know, maybe I'm just projecting here, but it'd be like, okay, well, if my music's good enough to put out, it's good enough to put out under my name, but you know, so I agree with Dan. I think it was Craven thing on the record company, you know, because uh, could, would his album have sold without this, you know, rumor mystique floating around it? Well, absolutely not, that. but they wouldn't even, but they wouldn't even, they wouldn't have even uh, released it without that. Yeah. You know, I mean, so I, I guess no, maybe, maybe that's, a whole reason, them, that's a whole but, reason this, this, yeah. this record existed to be honest. I, I, I think. But, uh, yeah, this was this was obviously done as a uh, uh, as what you know at the time concept albums were were just emerging at the time. This was obviously done as a contact album as a concept album. Because uh, I'm, I'm reading again the the back cover of this thing, and and each side is actually split into like four. I guess you call them chapters, right? Uh, chapter one labeled as intro is just the first track, Tales from a Wizard, okay? Labeled as chapter two, Prelude, are the tracks Devil's Child, Calm Before the Storm, Half a Life, Spiders Will Dance on Your Face While You Sleep, which is actually a pretty cool song. <laughs> the second side, chapter three, uh, is called Wizard, and uh, those tracks are Black Magic, White Magic, and Merlin. And then chapter four, to close it, are the two tracks, Stand Beside My Fire and Welcome to Hell. <laughs> uh, yeah, this, I, again, this, this, this album is, uh, it's, it's probably more Black Sabbath than it is The Doors, you know, because it, it's just, it's just, it's just that, it's just that aggressive, bottom heavy, rhythm heavy, uh, uh, hard rock, what we called hard rock, you know, that, 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 that was, that was, that was solely, that was evolving at the time into what we later, uh, learned, started calling heavy metal, right? Uh, you can almost call this proto metal, you know, it was sort of a prototype for, you know, part of that prototype for what heavy metal became. Um, there, uh, keyboards, uh, uh, Phantom is, uh, credited with piano, but you don't hear much piano here. It's just, it's just all, uh, lead guitar, uh, uh, bottom heavy bass, and just a pretty aggressive but standard uh, drum, drum line, rhythm section. Uh, the only other thing that, that I was thinking about when I was when I was listening to this is the guitar player. This is, uh, I got the feeling that, that, that I started thinking that. I started thinking Tony Iommi, right from Black Sabbath. This guy, this guy is, as yeah. Dean mentioned before, there's there's a lot of Tony Iommi here. If somebody would have told me that uh, uh, that who's oh, oh Phantom Phantom actually plays a guitar on this, but if if somebody told me that this guitar player was actually Tony Iommi in disguise, I would have believed it. 
because it does sound it, it, it the, this this guitar playing sounds more like Tony Omi guitar playing than 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 the vocals sound like Jim Morrison. Okay, yeah, I, I yeah. go along with that. through the oh, throughout yeah. the whole thing. Uh, but there are a couple songs on here, like the song "Calm Before the Storm." I thought uh, what's was the third track in the album. Come before the storm. That's where it sounds more like Morrison. That almost that almost sounds like it could be an outtake from an early Doors album. You know, if if, if you didn't listen to it too closely, it it could have been a Doors song. But at the same time, there's a song on here called Half a Life, which sounds like it could have been an outtake from a Blood Rock album. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and it's pretty good. It's 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 definitely competent. You know, it's not. It's yes. not bad. It's competent. I mean, these guys, uh, these guys who play on this, I mean, they were, you know, they were professionals. I mean, they sounded good. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were playing and they were pretty good at what they did. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's sorry to interrupt. Scott. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say it's a little bit of a, of a sh shame for Ted Pearson, if that is his real name and all that, that, he, you know, he was used this way, but I do believe, you know, had they just released it uh, or maybe a subsequent album as Ted Pearson and had more of a variety of material, I think it would have been good enough to, you know, release. Uh, so, suppo supposedly, supposedly this band, Walpurgis, did record an album after this. They couldn't sell it. They couldn't sell it. And that's and 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 then this thing that surfaced in 1990 called the Lost Album. There's some reports that it was that album that they recorded as Walper just a few years later. There's other reports that it was the album mm -hmm. by the band Walper just that they recorded before the Phantom album. So, but you know, I, I can't find any definitive uh, any definitive information okay. of what that actually was. Okay. Well, just the rumors, uh, just rumors. <laughs> The, the blogger that we've all been referencing, uh -huh. just, just to be official, the gentleman's name is R.D. Francis, and he has a book, um, and the book is titled Tales from a Wizard, the Oral History of Walpurgis, the Band Behind Phantom's Divine Comedy, Part One. And on his, I, so I, you know, I went through his initial blog post about this, and then he has additional posts where he actually does, he, he profiles each individual member of the band. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't read those. I didn't go that far into, you know, researching this. Uh, but the, um, suppose, suppose, suppose I, 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 let me go, i go back to this. One theory on the uh, origin of this album is that uh, there was a parent at one point, uh, there was an interview with a guy who was a, a producer up in Detroit, you know, who, who did a lot of this work. And the guy is Gary, Gary Gawinick, G-A-W-I-N-E-K, uh, out of, out of, out of Detroit, who, uh, who we think was a producer of this album, produced this album. And actually, it, actually it was all done in, in Detroit at the time. Uh, and then he took it to, uh, he took it to Bob Seeger's manager, according to this, according to this one story that I found, uh, he took it, he took it to, uh, Bob Seeger's manager. Well, it turned out that Bob Seeger, uh, his manager had had some, uh, not pleasant interactions previously with, uh, Ted Pearson. So Gawinnick thought that his, his, the only way he could figure out that he might get this album sold is through this, this guy who was Bob Seeger's manager. So he went to Bob Seeger's manager with this album, didn't tell him who it was, had him listen to it. The guy thought, yeah, it's pretty good and got behind it. And then Maybe at some point, you know, that that maybe been, would have been the seed of how this thing became such this mysterious piece of work. Who knows? That doesn't that sound that doesn't sound like it's uh, doesn't sound 
real plausible, but it's the only, <laughs> but it's the only, <laughs> only, only story I can find about, about the origins of this thing. I would, I would, I would guess, and you know, just, just thinking about it, going through all this, my take on this is that uh, Ted Pearson, uh, aka Arthur Pendragon, and Walpurgis, is that how you pronounce it, Walpurgis? I always pronounce it Walpurgis. Okay, Walpurgis. Who okay. knows? Uh, 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 uh. My take on this is that these were this was a this was a, a band who who probably had a pretty good following in Detroit and who mm-hmm. and it was probably pretty well known and 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 you know had had a good fan base in Detroit and they were trying to uh, they were trying to break through like some of their contemporaries you know Bob Seger Ted Nugent and Niggy Pop and all those that and they just and they and they, and, it, and it wasn't happening for them okay and so. Uh, so reports of this, and I haven't gone to listen to it. It's on YouTube, the, the Phantom's Lost album. I haven't listened to it. I want to go, but but every every report I'm reading on it is that it, it's different than this album. That he that that there are there are a lot of things on that Phantom Lost album supposedly that sounds like it it was like early Bruce Springsteen, right? So uh, so I'm so I'm thinking that this is a band who was like cycling through different styles and and trying to find a style that 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 would fit them well enough that they could get sold and so part of that whole process for him was okay let's i i I do i do a pretty killer jim morrison at times so let me let me let me try to do that a little bit uh you know let me try to uh, let's let's play uh let's play the guitar like uh like black sabbath does and let's try that see if that lands and just trying these different styles cribbing these different styles of successful bands that landed trying to find some success and they just couldn't do it. And then it's just on that one little thing that he did doing his little Jim Morrison impersonation that, uh, that somebody at Capitol records and whoever said, Oh yeah, I could, I could do something with that. And this is what they did with that. And then when they went and then they went, when they went back and followed up, people said, no, we're not interested. <laughs> you know, you know, we got out of you what, what we got, what we got out of you, you know? And, and so, uh, I don't know who knows, but that's, that's the best idea I could come up with. That, that is yeah. just, well, I, it was I, just, it I, was just the way, and I don't, I don't, I don't have your take, Bob, that, uh, that he, that he didn't, uh, that he wasn't allowing himself to be, uh, exploited. I, I think he, I think he, my, uh, my guess is that he, he was probably fine with it because it was his way to get a record contract and well, with, 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 with the thinking that okay my name's not going to be on it it's like this whole thing well you know it could be a thing well he could you know i mean this is this is some direction he could take with his career be this mysterious figure called the phantom or maybe he thought well i put out this album and it'll be so good and it'll be so successful that it'll just it'll just allow me to to go ahead and uh uh and 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 do what i want to do later you know it was, it was basically his foot in the door well there's also uh and i and i don't want to be beat up on the poor guy but Mm -hmm. i kind of have to wonder if if he wasn't just copying or anything he could find out there hoping something would stick because um i i i I learned earlier this today that wall purchase was the original working title of black sabbath's war pigs yeah. And, oh, I don't know. Oh, I, th- I think that's definitely what he was. I think he was just trying. I and, think he was um, just grabbing different yeah, miles from different people. The lost album that you're referencing uh, is on YouTube, and I just took a real quick look at it. And I I, lo- I started listening to it a little bit this morning. And the first cut on that is a song from Divine Comedy, and the oh, yeah. the the notes below it say something about that. Basically, it's a collection of demo tapes. So. It, I don't know if it was an actually a definitive album, you oh, know. Okay. Yeah. You know, but I haven't. I, I just started playing it. And I was like, oh well, that's the song from you know Divine Comedy. So I didn't go any farther into it. So I don't know what else is is there. It's like thirty some odd minutes, you know. So it's oh okay, yeah. But actually, Scott, I think <clears throat> your theory on that, how it, uh, I think it's pretty plausible, you know. Uh, these guys uh, with along Ted Pearson, you know, trying to break through on a national level. 
they kept trying the styles and, you know, they got an offer to record. And of course, I don't think capital put a lot into the marketing of this. No, but, no, no, no. Yeah. And had it sold a lot of copies or enough copies, you know, I think had a career. He might have had. They might have had a career. Yeah, and uh, that's the only. Yeah, we'll never know. But um, and who knows? Maybe it led to hit Ted Pearson's eventually, you know, uh, depression and you know, supposed purported, you know, ending his own life. But uh, talking about, <clears throat> and this could be a well, maybe a subject for a later time, but the whole Detroit sound, you know, in addition to the ones you, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, Nugent, Bob Seeger, the bigger ones, there's also Mitch Ryder. You mm-hmm. know, he came from Detroit. Uh, MC, MC5 came out of Detroit. MC, uh, Tommy that, James that, and that, the that Shondells. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. I didn't know they were from there. Yeah. And, and the MC5, of yeah, course, yeah. Motor City 5, and yeah. then... And that's not even talking about Motown, but that's a whole different thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then Grand Funk Railroad. Yeah, they came out of Detroit. Sure that enough. area. Yeah. And then, and then, the, and then Detroit also back uh, later, like in the in the nineties and into the two thousand, had had another little uh, resurgence with a with a bunch of uh, pretty good uh, garage rock rock bands. Not none of them that attained the. Uh, the, the stardom that uh, that Seeger and all those other guys did, but but uh, but but Detroit continued to to be a uh, to be a pretty yeah. fertile ground for uh, yeah. and for, I, I don't for, know for just for, ju- for just for just gu- guitar based rock and roll bands. <laughs> and I don't know if you mentioned him, Dan, but we we can't forget Iggy Pop. Oh no, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know the Stooges. and the Stooges. <laughs> well, Alice Cooper came out of Detroit. Originally, I mean, you know, yeah, you're right. He did. Atlanta yeah. and Phoenix, but they came out of Detroit. I yeah. mean, that was that was that was uh, that was a very 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 fertile. Yeah, it was city. a big rock and roll city. Yeah, yeah there was two different things going on. There was there was the uh, hard rock, and there was the uh, the Motown sound. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Motown but, sound. But you know, it's, it's uh, going back to Capitol releasing this thing. If if you believe this blogger, you know the album. I mean, the music was already recorded because they did it in that Detroit recording studio. Right. So, so the guy walks the completed music to Capitol. So I, you know, so we're assuming Capitol doesn't Somebody have to- did. We don't know. We don't know how it got from, from yeah, Detroit but it got to, to Capitol. To Capitol we don't know already done happened. and yeah. in the can. Yeah. So yeah. apparently Capitol didn't have to do anything other than put it out on vinyl. So, right. I mean, you know, Capital's got like, well, we got no investment in this thing. And if it sells, great. Right. Yeah. If it doesn't, yeah, we ain't lost that much. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I mean, it was literally handed to Capital more or less on a silver platter. Right, right. And according to that blogger, you know, um, he says that the band, you know, um, was allowed to go into the studio and record their stuff on off hours so there was like no money really buried into this thing so it was a you know there wasn't anything to lose by putting it out right right yeah no overhead at all right exactly <laughs> yeah yeah i don't i don't recall that they ever did any marketing or, or anything like that the only marketing that the only marketing that i can remember happening is that is that they probably they probably leaked this little rumor out to the out to cream magazine and rolling stone and stuff that uh that we've got this long lost jim morrison album or jim morrison is you know popped in and recorded this album or something they you know they did buy they did buy the advertising or, or marketing or anything like that they just kind of you know their publicist just called these uh called these rock rock journalists and uh, planted this plan of the story you know which uh <laughs> and also you already know this but i think it's worth mentioning that in this interview with uh manzarek by allison steel <laughs> uh manzarek was pretty good at, at promoting you know that hmm that mystery and uh, he says well he goes we never saw the body did we and he goes don't forget the words that Jim wrote, remember when we were in Africa? He goes, maybe, he, you know, <laughs> so I, I think Manzarek had a little bit of into that. I don't know if he encouraged it or, 
you know, but um, well, yeah, that was that was part of Manzara. That was part of Manzarek's uh, mission to keep that door story alive, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it's just, you know, I mean, he 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 was always as dramatic as he could get away with being. He was always as uh, mystic as he could get away with being. I mean, that became that became Ray Manzarek's mission in life was to keep the door story alive, keep that Jim Morrison story alive, you know. Yeah, and it. Uh... And it worked. <laughs> and it worked. Well, he, he was very successful at it. He was very successful at it. Yep, he sure was. <laughs> Robbie Krieger and John Densmore, who were still with us, uh, you know, it's, it's like they, you know, like, like, like we're talking about Krieger shot down some of those man's Eric stories. I, uh, yeah, yeah, he was graduating mm-hmm. and things like that. But, but, I, but I promise you that I promise you that that, that Krieger is, is very grateful that man's Eric was able to do that because, because Krieger, still got, Krieger still got a career. Krieger mm-hmm. still got some, 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 some nice income coming in because mm-hmm. Ray Man's Eric yes. spent decades keeping that story alive. I'm sure every time you get healthy, <laughs> thank you, Ray. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. In, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, Densmore, Densmore has got a whole different career, though. He, he's become a, Densmore has become a fairly prolific writer. What? He has about four yeah. books out now and, 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 uh, and and I've I've seen where he's he's actually he actually does a, does a lot of freelance writing for magazines and stuff. I I noticed so so Densmore's got that whole other career going on. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, let's wrap this up. Any 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 last thoughts on the Phantom's Divine Comedy before we put a wrap on this thing and and put it up in the cloud? Other than I would just say, you know, if, if you're interested in, in the doors, um, check this out. It, it's, it's a fascinating little sidelight to their history. It's a nice and little footnote. Yeah. A nice little footnote. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's, it's a fun listen. I mean, it's not terrible. You know, it, it's, it's a little derivative, but it's, it's, it's not a bad listen. It, it's a fun listen. So check it out. Mm-hmm. Okay, gang. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for this discussion. And thanks everybody for listening. Yeah, go go to streaming and check out Phantom's Divine Comedy. I I I think you'll enjoy. I think you'll enjoy it. Like I say, it's it, like we we're saying, it's not a bad album. It's 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 a competent album. And if you're into, uh, you know, if you're into like early Black Sabbath, early Blue Oyster Cult, you know, that whole sound is coming out of Detroit. This will be right up your alley. Uh, you know, it's just that, you know, they were, they were very derivative of that stuff. It, it, you know, the thing is, it's nothing new here, nothing that you haven't heard before, but it, it's competent. It's pretty good. There's a couple of, a couple of ear, a couple of ear hole pieces in there. You know, the one song has like been stuck in my brain for a week. I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, the wizard. <laughs> Okay, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Check us. Uh, check us. Check back with us on Friday when we'll have another edition of Freeform Friday. We'll see you then. So long. Right. Care later.